I'll just hit record. Oh, Tamsin's done it. Thank you, Tamsin. You're the best. Um, so coming up swiftly in our um, sites is International Women's Day on the 8th of March. And this year, the themes are inspiring inclusion and investing in women. So over the course of a week or so, we're going to be focusing on the United Nations actions areas, which is ending poverty, supporting human rights, implementing gender responsive financing, shifting to a green economy and care society, and supporting feminist change makers, of which we have two in the house today. Well, at least two. There are more of us than two here, but we have two very special guests in the house today. Um, Valentage from Changing Suits. So if you want to know more about what we are doing as an employer, how we are publishing practices, how we work in learning and career development and what we do with our local communities, keep your eyes peeled on social media. Penny Trees has put together an awesome campaign for us um, that really showcases the breadth of what we've achieved as an Emerald Global community. Um, and we'll be sharing that over the course of the week. So without further ado, I will hand over to our Vicky and our special guests. Um, and please do put questions in the chat. I will be collecting them as we go along. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thanks, Danielle. So yes, welcome everyone to our first keynote event to celebrate this year's International Women's Day. So the broad theme for International Women's Day this year is inspire inclusion, but this is also being used in conjunction with the United Nations 2024 theme of invest in women. So we could think of no better people to invite to speak to us on this uh, today in this first session. So a huge warm welcome to Balantage, who it's been my absolute pleasure to get to know over the past year through the Unlimited Mentoring Scheme. Um, so we'll discuss today uh, their mission, which is really, truly inspiring. But what I think you will hear today is that Balantage are, are the essence of founder owners. Changing suits is them and it wouldn't be where it is without their, their passion, without their drive with that, their willingness to adapt and and laugh in the face of challenges sometimes. And I think you do need that that humour when you are uh, starting out as a new business. Um, if you have listened to their podcast, you'll know that they are refreshingly honest and they do say things as they are. They're also sisters. Uh, so they'll not only be, be able to talk to us, today, but to us today about social enterprise, but also what it's like to work with your family day to day. Um, uh, just before we <laughs> just before we start, uh, I'd like to say a really warm welcome to some attendees outside of Emerald. Um, so our partners at TNQ, KGL, and Integra in India. I'm really happy that you could join us today. I hope it's the first of many events we can do together, and I hope you enjoy it. Um, so we are going to keep things fairly informal for this session. I'll kick off with some questions for, for Balantage and then we'll open up to the audience. Danielle's going to monitor the chat, so post questions as they come to you and, and we'll ensure at the end that we don't miss anything. OK, so let us kick off. Um, so it would be great if the two of you could talk to us a bit about your own backgrounds um, and how Changing Soups came about. Yeah, so um, like you, you saw, said, Vicky, uh, my name's Val, um, and this is Taj, who is my sister. Um, we started the organisation about three years ago. Um, it started from the fact that we had the Changing Suits podcast. Um, we were having, because we are quite close um, as sisters, and we have that gossip session, and we enjoy ourselves, and we talk about our lives. These were the same conversations we were having with other people around us, so our friends and the rest of the community. Um, and we basically said, let's move these gossip sessions onto the podcast so people can listen to what we're talking about, because essentially it will resonate with a lot of people that are going through the same thing. So we are second generation. We live in the UK. So the influence of um, our parents from uh, who've come from the east, they were from India, Punjab, um, coming over, but also adapting to the life here. Essentially, we were born here. So we're sort of combining the two cultures and we talk about the good things and the bad things of both cultures and how sometimes it can be difficult to explain both cultures to to the other side. And that's essentially what the podcast is about. Um, our experiences. Um, we do like having a laugh. Um, we've been through a number of things as a family, like most people have. Um, and one thing that we have learned is if you can't do anything else, you just have to laugh at it because there's nothing else you can do, do with it. And that's where it started from with the with changing suits. 
touch I'll, I'll just add to that so um just a bit more personal about us so we're three sisters and Bao is the youngest I'm the middle and um quite so basically our parents had three girls and yes they were waiting for the boy so uh, once they had their son that was it they were done they had um hit that taboo of we've got a son now oh it's not another girl so that's why they stopped after that and um we have quite a lot of direct experience like Val said um having that taboo of having three girls in the family getting married off having the dowry having enough money for us basically to live and having that community always looking at us and thinking what will the community say in pretty much every decision that we make I just want to add, I mean, the other thing that has come about, we do on the podcast itself, we talk about a wide range of um, issues. So when we initially started, it was our lived experiences um, looking at gender inequality. But again, I mean, we lived in the same household, have the same parents, same siblings. But the interesting thing was we saw things from a very different point of view and we hadn't realised until we were having these conversations on the podcast as to how different Taj's perspective of the same event was from mine and how that obviously then impacts our lives now as well. So that was the, the start of the, the journey. And I think you started the podcast during COVID. Um, and at that time, did you foresee what would happen as a result of that or, or how changing suits would evolve? Because it's it's gone beyond the podcast now. It, it's, you know, and you've got a lot of plans for, for, for the evolution of, of changing suits. The answer is a clear no. I mean, like I said, I think when we started the podcast, it was just a bit of a gossip session between me and Taj having a bit of a laugh, talking about a few serious issues. Um, but then what then evolved from that was the fact that we had um, we had other people coming on talking about their lived experiences, things that we obviously hadn't gone through. And also on topics where we perhaps hadn't realised the way we might have approached it probably wasn't the way, best way of doing that. I mean, I'll give you an example. I always use this example. One of the things um, within the Asian um, community is you tend to have checklists of uh, things that you have to do. So you do your education, you go to university, get married, have kids and you're pretty much done then. Um, go to work obviously and then and then you're done and you know one of the things that came up on one of the topics on the podcast was the fact that you know one of the questions after you get married oh are you pregnant um, and these kind of questions I've realized from um, some of our episodes they're too personal especially in a day and age where people might be having difficult they might not want to get married they might not want to do things that we're asking questions about so it's really changed the way we live ourselves it's also changed my life I mean um, I've changed what I do. I mean, we're working full time on changing suits. We had support services coming on because one of the issues that we found is, yes, these are taboo topics within the South Asian community, but we're not getting the support that we should be getting. Um, so if there is an issue, we're not going out there. They, there are organisations that can help us. And then as it's evolved, um, our work with service providers and what support is out there we're realising that it's insufficient. Things that are currently going on in our community, we shouldn't be just thinking it's OK, um, that it's not catered to all communities, not just um, the South Asian communities, but all communities um, mm -hmm. in the UK, because we are so, the UK is so diverse. I mean, with the podcast, one thing that is essential is that we're getting to a wide range of audience so it's nationally and internationally we're in people's homes and people are going through these different experiences and we've had a lot of feedback where they've said okay this is really helping me go through my experience and I think that is the most rewarding thing for us yesterday I went out shopping um, and just thinking, OK, Bao didn't know that I'm not working at the moment. So I'll go out quickly, <laughs> which I've revealed now. And I bumped into someone that had been listening to our podcast and she was explaining about the divorce that she had gone through and how listening to our podcast made her feel part of a community. So we've created that safe space where now people are coming to us and being open about what they're going through. We're getting men that are opening up to us I mean, I had an experience where there was a big butch man and you wouldn't expect him to be going through the mental health issues that he's going through. And he just opened up and explained what was happening in his life. And there was no holding back because we had created this safe space 
now with our workshops that we do, our events that we do, people are really opening up because they know that we're here to listen and we want to make a change. And we can do this together if we are open to doing so. I just want to add, sorry, Vicky, on that point. I mean, yeah. in regards to the events that we're doing, a lot of them are about raising awareness. Essentially, Changing Suits is looking at the culture um, and why culture is so important as to how we're engaging um, support services. So we do work with the NHS. We've, we're doing work um, with a wide range of services with local authorities. And now we are starting to work um, within the corporate sector as well, talking to companies, how EDI can't just be that acronym that no one actually understands. We need to be using the using the information that we have and the people that we have um, to make a practical change in people's lives. Yeah, just for the benefit of the audience, in case they've not listened to the to the podcast, um, what kind of taboo to topics are you covering? <laughs> to be fair, there's so many taboos. I mean, yeah. we have uh, episodes coming out every week, so it's not yeah. a problem. It works out <laughs> quite well for us having those taboos, I suppose. <laughs> Um, we so domestic oh, abuse is one that's really hit a nerve with people because it's such a big issue in the community and there's so many different angles to it. There's certain members of the community that feel that you should stay married or in a relationship no matter what happens. And although we work on culture, there is an influence with religion as well. Um, uh, there's uh, fertility. Bao, do you want to name some more? Yeah, so one of the podcasts that did do really well, and obviously this, um, the events that you have um, going on is for International Women's Day, is yes, a lot of these inequalities, um, taboo topics affect women. But also on the other side, one of the most popular one that we had was uh, men's mental health and suicide. Um, so and the impact it has on the whole family and um so that that was really an eye opener. Again, we're talking to people with lived experiences. So people that do come on are going through very, very personal things, things that most people in our community won't be talking out loud about. Um, so we really do appreciate everything, a single story that comes on and talks to us and tells us their, their point of view. Um, we've spoken about things like dementia. We've spoken about diabetes. So it covers a wide range of things, even our awareness events um, that we do. The first one we had was breast cancer. Again, uh, anything um, health related um, in the Asian community, you tend not to talk about health. But when you're talking about something like breasts, um, that's even more of a taboo. The event that we had, absolutely fantastic. We had men and women um, coming along and asking questions. We had we had the image of a breast so that the consultant could explain, um, you know, what you should be looking out for. And men were sitting in the audience um, asking questions as well. So it's these type of barriers that we're trying to break. Yes, there are big barriers and we wouldn't be able to do it. We can't do it on our own. But it's about opening up that conversation, essentially. So you started Two Sisters, a podcast during COVID. You've, you've started to evolve that into events, consultancy, training. You know, you've really seen that there's this need and... You know, you feel passionately about filling that gap. Um, but as as a social entrepreneurs, I guess what what motivates you to keep going on the one hand, um, but what has surprised you on that journey as well? I think the most important thing is the feedback from the community that we're supporting. People coming to us, messaging us, and saying this has changed my life. I'm happy. I mean, I know now there's a community for us, that someone's listening, that it's not just me going through this alone. And I think that keeps us motivated to carry on, that it's not just we're doing this it, and no one's listening and it's not changing anyone's life because we want to support people out there. And I think that's the biggest thing for us. Yeah. yeah. And added to that, I mean, we enjoy it as well. I mean, we are sisters. Yes, we drive each other crazy at certain points. Um, there's no doubt about that. But um, we do enjoy what we're doing. And again, not only the podcast, but the events that we do, we are connecting with people. We do enjoy those connections as well and laughing with people. And yes, some, a lot of the topics we're talking about are very serious, but there's always a, a silver lining, a nice little spin that you can make on it where you are smiling at the end of it. And that's really important for us to get out there. Uh, people aren't by themselves. Um, a lot of people are going through very similar situations. 
I mean, being sisters, we will probably uh, not be very PC with each other. So we will cross the lines that we shouldn't. But we know that we if we cross too far, we go to the hierarchy, our father. He will put us in place. He is HR for us. So if it goes too far, we know we're going to get sorted out. That's hilarious. And I know, I mean, we've had some discussions about, I guess, some of the surprises along the way and, and the fact that whilst, you know, you're talking a lot about community and, and how much the community needs these support services, needs these discussions, You've also had the converse from the com community as well in terms of maybe some resistance to change or resistance to participation. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? You need to remember a lot of these topics are taboo yeah. topics. Um, they've yeah. been going on for generations and generations. And let's one thing that we tr do try to get across on all of our platforms is the fact that there's good and bad um, in both, you know, the South Asian community has some fantastic things and we need to celebrate those things. Conversely, there's things that we need to realise we need to be talking about. We need to stop it from being a taboo. I mean, Taj mentioned domestic abuse. Um, you know, it it is not OK, full stop. Um, it doesn't matter what community you're in. And even now, when we talk to support services and they're saying, look, they tried to get into the South Asian community, but they had so much resistance. You know, we had a conversation where the person they had employed got abuse. We've got to a stage um, with our organisation where, especially within the Southwest and like Taj said, there's certain parts of our platforms that are UK wide. Um, a lot of our events are done in the Southwest. Um, we are trusted within the community because of all of the work that we've done. Um, it has been difficult getting there because there is that trust barrier. However, we've got communities coming to us saying, look, you can use our space to have those conversations about domestic abuse. Um, and that's something we're finding that services might not have access to because unfortunately, perhaps they haven't built that trust. They haven't got those relationships, but essentially, perhaps they don't have that background and maybe the training that from we do, we've done a num number of focus groups, for example, with service providers statutorily that they are looking at the the equalities act of 2010 however how does that then translate into real life when they're talking to people and these are the conversations we're trying to have have with them and we are look we are lay people we come from the south asian community and we are quite open um about how you can talk to us you know we've had conversations with service providers where it perhaps wasn't pc but we're totally okay with that because if it helps that person ask that question and get a response from our point of view, then that's that's a brilliant thing in itself. Um, and this is where I talk so much, I forgot what the question was. Sorry, Tad, you can take over. <laughs> so I was going to say the shocking factor is, but a nice shocking factor is, we've had a lot of support um, from the community and the males as well in the community, I think, have been very supportive. And what we found is people want something like changing suits and they're willing to support us, volunteer, because they know that it's needed. Although there have been challenges where it's been a bit of a resistance. But I think that's we can improve that just with education and why we're here. Because sometimes the unknown can be scary. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to educate. We're not here to say, you have to do it this way. We're, we want to help. So le leading on from that, then, what what's your advice to businesses? So businesses are, you know, work operating in a heavily multicultural environment these days, even even if that's not the case within, you know, your own business, you're working with suppliers, vendors, partners all over the world. Um, so what what's your advice for, for businesses in terms of how they can provide a really supportive and honest environment? To be fair, Vicky, I mean, I think, you know, we've had yourself as a mentor for, for the last year. I can't believe it's been a year. But, you know, we've spoken to people in Emerald as well. And it's quite clear, you know, what you're trying to do and, you know, those conversations you're having within Emerald are fantastic. They're very open. And we love that. The whole point is we don't know everything. There's conversations that we're having where I'm learning every single time we're having the conversation. Maybe I did do something wrong there. Maybe I should have said it like that. And I think that's really important within 
the corporate sector within the, within the public sector it's about having those conversations because companies are so diverse that's fantastic you could ask those people within your um, company um, the same questions that you're sort of wondering how you should deal deal with things and that that's such a, a brilliant thing you've got all the people there it's just how you have those communications I would have um, thought I mean one of the th things with certain services is it can be a tick box exercise we need to step away and and the South Asian community in any community would know when it's a tick box exercise. So we need to step away from do that and actually deliver what is being put out there and what we're learning. And also, for example, if we're recruiting people from uh, just recruiting people, we often have this thing where we go for comfort, where we recruit someone, for example, that is similar to us. And I think if we start stepping out of our comfort, and going to, for example, different communities, they can bring a different dimension into our organisation and make us see things in a different way. If that's not amazing, I don't know what is. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to open up to the floor soon, so please do get your questions through in the chat. Um, but I wanted to just shift tack a little bit and talk about, talk about what it's like to be a social a female social entrepreneur in this kind of environment that we're in which is you know not funding rich to be honest so you know I know that you you've been applying for funding you know you're you're pretty much doing everything just the two of you at the moment um so just talk us through that journey a bit and and what what that's like and you know what your day-to-day -day kind of worries worries challenges are i think the the biggest part is look every organization doesn't matter if you're a social enterprise enterprise whether you're a company whatever your um, status is it needs to be sustainable and there needs to be income coming in and that's one of the things where you asked earlier your learnings that's a big learning for us obviously we started this not thinking okay it's going to turn into what it has which is fantastic it has turned there but we do want to carry on making the changes that we have started to make. We do want to do it at a more strategic, higher level. Um, we So that's the biggest learning for me. What is the next thing? So I think anyone that is looking to do anything um, like this, whether it's organisation, whatever your setup is, is you need to be adaptable. You need to be flexible. You need to listen to what's being said. And there have been there's been plenty of knockbacks. I mean, I had one this morning where I, I was like, Taj, look at this. What, what's happened here? Um, and it happens. You've just got to pick yourself up, talk to Taj, um, get really angry with them, who, whatever's um, caused it. And then you have to move on because you don't have a choice. You need to get, get on with it because it's it is a tough environment. Um, funding is hard, whether it's, you know, grant funding, whether it's public sector, whether it's um, the corporate sector. It's really, really tough at the moment. Um, and I think the fantastic thing, the lucky position we've been in is the fact that I am doing this um, with my sister and it does make a lot. It makes life a lot easier because of that. So I can pick up the phone and really go for it. Um, I'm trying not to swear. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it is a tough environment. You have to be adaptable and just get on with it. Yeah, like Bao said, the funding is really hard to get. And I think that's with any organisation, but particularly in the social entrepreneur um, sector, it's getting less and less. And it's about making connections and seeing how we can work with others to make any of our work stronger. And that's why we have to be flexible. We have to move with the times and be ready for the next challenge. And we always have to think a step ahead. OK, if this happens what's next and I think that's the only way that you can get through any of this is think okay if there's a knockback I mean we have had knockbacks but maybe it will take us down a different route and maybe a better route so we have to always try to keep ourselves positive and also and Vicky's been an amazing mentor when we did have a big knockback um, I think we did kind of let it go and Vicky really helped us calm down so thank you for being there for us you've been amazing well, not at all. It's been Can I just pleasure. add on on that point actually yeah. from from people that I've spoken to from the South Asian yeah. community, we don't have mentors that are out there, and this is something our organisation is looking at as well. And we've definitely seen the benefit of it. 
um, to the point where we sort of begged um, Vicky not to leave us this week. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's so important to surround yourself with like-minded people, people that can help you and are there to support you. I mean, we've got 85 people on this um, on this call today. So, you know, get on our social media, make sure you follow us, engage with us because we only know what people want um, if we know what's going on out there. So mm -hmm. we'll expect uh, loads of followers after we finish yeah. this call. Absolutely. <laughs> also, just while we are talking about Vicky, yeah. um, it's amazing. Your person personality is amazing. And whoever we've spoken to your in your organisation, they have been singing your prayers. And I think that's the key thing. If you're a good manager and you're a good leader and the people that you're managing are happy with what they're doing, what else can you ask for? Let's carry on so, doing this because I can tell Vicky's oh my God, I'm I'm comfortable with it. Let's <laughs> carry on. Let's stop that now. Let's stop. <laughs> we have got some questions in the chat. So, Danielle, are you able to yep. come on <clears throat> and just run through them for us? Yep. So, we, first question is on recruitment from Emma. Um, one of the challenges that we sometimes have in Emerald is accessing different communities and encouraging them to apply for roles in publishing. Um, this links back, I think, to the, what you were saying about trust, but do you have any thoughts on the best way to approach that and to make careers in publishing um, sound very exciting? <laughs> There's only so much we can do, Daniel. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> In regards to recruitment, we are just about to take on uh, two people um, in the next few weeks, actually. It's it's tough. I think whichever industry you're in, it's it's tough. One thing um, that we found is obviously that connection has to be there. However, the people that we are looking to recruit aren't people, I'm going to say like us. I mean, that I just mean Asian women um, from exactly the same background. I mean, going back to the question that was asked earlier, um, why is it important that we do have diverse um, workforces? How do we make sure we get the best out of them? Essentially, if we do go for people that aren't the same as us, we will be able to access more communities and more conversations. I mean, Taj went out this morning talking to, to talk to one of the people we're looking to recruit. It's not a woman, it's a man that we're going to recruit and from a slightly different background. Um, how do you access them? I mean, I think if an organisation shows that they are willing to listen and have those conversations. I think it's really important. It's understanding <clears throat> we're not just the colour of our skin. There's a lot more that's, uh, that goes on beyond that. And that's where I think the Equalities Act stops. I mean, this was something that we learned on um, a talk with which we, Vicky was one of the panellists, um, along with a number of other people. It's not just the colour of our skin, it's our background. You know, do we have kids? Don't we have kids? You know, what do people expect of us? And that's only going to be coming from conversations that we're having. You, you know, I wouldn't be comfortable going into a job interview saying, yes, I've got two kids uh, that this year, year old. They're not going to, it's not going to happen. Um, again, I'm talking too much. I've forgotten what the question was. <laughs> so basically, it's... I'll carry on from that. Um, Another thing with service providers is they use this term, which I do not like. It's hard to reach communities. And we found that community, well, we know that communities aren't hard to reach. It's just that there isn't that willingness or understanding of how to reach them. And if you get that, for example, with publishing, I wouldn't immediately think, OK, for example, a South Asian thing. So it has to be an almost like telling a story. The story is very important. It helps people connect and that you are able to do this. It's not just certain people in the community that will go down this field. I think that's very important with a lot of industries that it is open to the whole world, the whole world community. Especially when it is research. I mean, we we know from from research the fact that it is very um, white orientated. I mean, I was in politics what is it old what is it old uh male and stale, stale. Something like that. I thought it was really stale, yeah <laughs> I that. I like, it's interesting I mean we have to engage other people um we're working quite closely with the NIHR looking at scientific research um the Asian population doesn't get involved in research partly because we don't know how to but also you know we've never thought about it we you know we've been stuck in this bubble what is going on in the real world um out there and that's something all communities um, need to understand we need to start engaging yeah brilliant advice thank you rebrand re publishing change the name of publishing <laughs> 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 okay 
duly noted. That was on a recording Oh, as no, well. I shouldn't have said that, um, should I? <laughs> you're all good. You're all good. Um, next question is from Mundia, who asks, have you experienced people who behave and think in one way while in the UK, but revert to previous behaviours or thinking when visiting friends and family outside the UK? Is there anything you can recommend to help remove the perceived need to accept negative behaviours when travelling to a location that still adopt those behaviours? Oh, Taj, that's a difficult one. I think everybody's got, no, I've just jumped in. I think everyone's got that um, aspect. How I, I'll be talking on this call um, is very different to how I'll be talking to Taj later on. It's, it's one of those things. I suppose it's communication, education. Um, and also something that I'm learning uh, again through this process is actually saying, no, this is wrong. Um, to people you don't agree with. And that's a very hard thing. I am a people pleaser, unfortunately. So I find that really difficult. Um, but actually saying how you feel, I think is really important, whichever, whatever the situation, if you don't agree with something, then we need to learn to say it in the right way, um, but say it nonetheless, I would have, I would have thought. I mean, in the South Asian community, I would say a majority more than the males. Um, no, actually both. Um, I We had this thing where, we have to respect our elders. So we say yes, yes, yes to everything. And it's unlearning those things that we've been taught, basically, that are instilled in us. And almost, could I use the words having a backbone? Probably not the quite the right language, to be honest. Um, but yeah, learning how to say OK, but using the right language, in this case, I didn't. But to say, no, I don't want this. This is not OK. And setting those barriers and boundaries. everyone everyone needs to look after <laughs> yeah everyone needs to look after their mental health and if that's that's more important than anything to be honest yeah. Yeah. fabulous emily asks um where do you plan on taking changing suits in the future well, we can take over the world um, <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I think when we like like we we keep saying we didn't expect to be where we are now um when we started as we've been doing things we have seen where the gaps are we've seen where the opportunities are and again we're trying to be as adaptable as we can at the moment capacity is an issue once we get the staffing we should um, be doing everything but there are big gaps that we'd love to to fill um and you know like I said we're working a lot with the public sector with um, starting to talk to a lot of um, corporate um, the sector as well um, but essentially our focus is within the community we need to be making a big difference and we do have some big things over the next year or so so keep your eyes peeled we put it all on social media so you'd be the first to know <laughs> i mean one thing that we one thing that we're getting is we're getting um people in the community that are reaching out to us that want to be part of this journey and want to connect so we are venturing out and um, we're open to anyone that wants to join the journey amazing thank you very much we've got a question come through from sangeeta um sharing her personal experience uh, in her personal experience she feels that often first generation immigrants tend to try and preserve their culture very strongly while second generation faces more issues balancing what they learn at home and the culture that they grow up in. Yeah. Uh, Sangeet is wondering how you address that gap. Well, that was the biggest gap that we were trying to address when we first came, did the podcast. Look, it doesn't matter which generation we're looking at, everybody has the pressures. When the first generation came over, they were dealing with immense racism. They had to um, start again. Um, and I couldn't imagine doing what my parents did at all. And I don't know half the stories um, that, that my parents, the things that my parents went through. I mean, again, we we started this whole journey because we don't want to be passing on the same things to our children and the next generation will be going on to a whole other um, load of things you know we went through when with the second generation we went through having to uh, we lived with our grandparents so we went to appointments with them because they couldn't speak english we you know woke up in the middle of the night when there was medical problems and we were very very young when we did that but I think one thing that I will always say is I never regret the fact that we live in, lived um, with our grandparents. Um, I think it was the best thing that that we had because we learned and we grew as people. This is us because of the experiences we had. So I don't think, you know, depending, obviously that's a, 
some people go through very, very hard situations. So it's very easy for, for me to say that in regards to that. But I think whatever we go through, we have to take it as a learning and make sure if you're not happy with it, then it doesn't get passed on to the next generation. And we have to adapt as well. With Belle, um, she enjoyed, and so did I, but she was a favourite grandchild, so she enjoyed it even more. <laughs> yes, I, I was, I'm not going <laughs> to. But there's positives and negatives. I mean, my, my husband, for example, didn't have didn't live with um, the older generation, so he finds it a lot harder to talk to the older generation. It's quite amusing. So if anyone wants to see that, it's quite entertaining when he does try. Um, but it, it, it's part of your personality. Uh, we're in a nice sort of generation, I thought, I think. But one thing I can say is... They have the saying, a leopard can't change his spots. I think my dad is an example of, yes, they can. He came into the country when I think he was about 28. And his thinking was um, a girl should get married at a, a very young age, 17, 18. And through his life experiences, he's completely changed the way he thinks. And now he's more... He, he got us into university. He wanted us to be educated women, independent. Be. Um, I remember when I stopped working when I was married, and my dad was like, "Why have you stopped working? You know, you need to be independent." So there is hope. We can change even the older generation. It's about explaining and talking to them. When I go out there in the community and you just talk to people one to one, you can, if you have that connection with them and explain to them why certain things and are going on they are willing to listen obviously you're going to have certain people that just it's no they will just stick to the way that they are but sometimes you have to cut your losses and think okay this person is never going to change and you can't force someone to change thank you that accidentally answered Sunil's question so Sunil I hope that did answer your question um moving on we've got one from Valeria um saying the positions available in the market always restrict country and the place the professionals should be even if it is a home office based role do you see any change in the future with a more open world opportunity for all cultures i think um one of the things covid did was open the world up um i think um like i said i'm i was previously in politics i think we need to be taking positions, um, whichever, whoever we are in leadership roles, in places that can make a difference, because we can all essentially make a difference. If you don't agree with, you know, a certain policy that you've looked, you, you've seen that is unfair, then we need to be calling it out. Obviously, it's very easy to say um, there are systemic barriers that we need to deal with. But, but again, if, if someone doesn't know that this is happening, surely that's the biggest problem. Um, if you're finding it an issue, whichever country you're in and you're finding these barriers um, with you accessing whatever you're trying to access, you've got to be having those conversations. Um, I think that's that's one thing we've we found. Unless someone knows what's going on, there's nothing that can change um, whatever the often, issue is. There. Yeah, often we look to others to change processes etc but we need to be those leaders we need to step up to the plate and we can be the ones that influence and help the next generation brilliant we're moving on to a slightly different topic now from Sarjit and Kathy Sarjit has asked narcissism is one of the topics that is widely discussed within communities and mental health as women we are told to just keep quiet and leave it alone or ignore it what are your thoughts on that? And Kathy adds, um, there is a, a difference between narcissism and abuse. I can't say narcissism, sorry, and abuse. Mm -hmm. So is that addressed too? I mean, one of the, um, the, the law actually changed in the UK um, in regards to this. And it, now it is legally, um, when someone is going through domestic abuse, narcissism, narcissism I've got what you've got, Daniel, now, um, <laughs> is actually um, a term. I think that from a personal um, point of view, and again, <laughs> we've been through a lot as, as a family, and this is an issue that we have had to deal with. And it's quite a raw issue, a raw issue um, because we're going through it right now. Unfortunately, um, I think systems generally need to change something unless, again, we raise our voice as to how this is affecting us and um the impact it has i think this is a massive issue within the south asian community from what i've seen but i'm sure within many other communities but we need to be having those conversations 
if someone is going through something, they need to be going to support groups, find out what someone else has done and the experiences they've had. Um, they won't all be the same, but it's about finding that support. And I think one thing that's come about from our point of view is community is a massive thing within the South Asian community. Um, and it's actually quite a central thing, but it's got its positives and negatives. Um, it, one thing, you know, you need to find that person or people that you can really talk to and give you the best possible advice and professional help as well. Um, I think that's so important. Uh, the South Asian community doesn't use therapists. They, you know, we don't see the importance of mental health. Yes, that is slowly, very slowly changing. But, you know, I, I personally don't think it's changing quick enough. It's important to talk to someone else as a professional. And even if the other that therapist isn't a, a South Asian, because again, there is a, a very low number of South Asian therapists out there. Again, if you find someone it's about that communication, but this is a massive topic, topic in itself. I mean, if I could solve this one, our family would be a lot happier. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one thing that we also need to do ourselves is watch the way we behave as well. I remember there's this saying, and it's a Punjabi saying, is um, ek job so sok, meaning one person stays silent. And they're it's probably not the right, exactly right translation, but you have thousands of peace and it's just a peaceful environment basically and that's um Belle do you want to translate even more or yeah no no I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that I thought she was like no that's not the right translation I'm but wondering what you're going to say next so hopefully it's um the right thing to say but I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> so basically yeah if one person stays quiet you'll have a peaceful life and you don't have to deal with so many different issues and that's something that we need to change ourselves and if we don't talk out the next generation for example I've got a daughter and if she sees me stay silent, then it's just going to carry on. It's going to be a generational thing. The trauma that I carry is just going to carry on to the next generation. So if not anything else, we need to break this cycle and we need to step up and be the one that break the cycle and um, say, I'm not going to accept this anymore. It's a hard thing to do, but slowly, I think we're getting there very slowly. Again, it's easy to say, very hard to do. So it's a massive step with anyone trying to get support. Sarge actually says that is the proverb we grew up with here in Malaysia. Yeah. The next question is from Sangeeta again. I appreciate we've got just over 15 minutes left, so I'll try and get through these all. But um, it was interesting to know that men are engaging and opening up with changing suits. Do you have any tips on how we can encourage more engagement from men in our company and discussions that are related to social issues, what has worked for you? I think it's really interesting. Uh, to... Sorry, I think that's huh? something. I think that... Unmute. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Again, if we're going to be making a change, it has to. And this was one thing when we started off. Yes, we are two women on the podcast talking about our experiences but there was one um, podcast that we did episode we did and this is where it started it off to change the sort of journey that we went on um where we were talking to a man who um who lost his wife to cancer and he got remarried within quite a short period of time and one thing he said in that conversation was we were talking about just living within laws at that point and that's another taboo topic within the south asian community like i said many taboo topics but um he he did say from the man's perspective do you not understand why the situation you're explaining why the man acted like he did because everyone's got their own perspective men in the south asian community like with all communities have their own pressures that i won't understand um you know we might live in extended families i married into um the family i lived with my in-laws but i would never understand what he went through trying to you know, I suppose balance is one word we've used, but making sure that I was happy and his family were, was happy. In regards to the question is, we are starting to talk to a lot more men. Like I said, one of the um, most popular um, episodes was looking at men's mental health. And what's interesting, when you listen to a podcast, you don't have to be outwardly say, hey, I'm listening to a, a podcast about suicide and the effect on me. Um, so that's a really interesting thing. Men are starting to realise um, that they do need to open up it's very hard for them to do that but what is it that um, will help them open up I mean my husband has just started um, a club with his physical activity yet they're not sitting down and talking but that at some point during the day 
they then go out for lunch and talk about things that they're going through. So what is it that you can do to connect with someone else that will help open up that conversation? Um, and I think it is becoming easier. But some people, I don't know, it's, it's a tough one, but I, I feel like men are actually starting to open up a lot more. Um, someone said to me at events, men are a lot more open in saying, you know, I've got a problem with this. Whereas men, uh, women tend to shy away from saying it in an event where it's so open, whereas are happier to do it one to one. So it's a really interesting sort of um, scenario. But we are having important conversations with men as well. And it's about building that trust. And hopefully through our organisation that has already started to happen. I mean, yeah, like Bao said, the important thing is that we're not just talking about women's issues. We're understanding the point of men as well, which is vitally important because we all are like a jigsaw puzzle and we all fit together and we need to see how it works. And we're all in this world together. So the whole we need to understand the whole dynamics from the male perspective and the female perspective. And um, I think what's working for us is why men are opening up for us is we've shown that we're out there to listen then we're not going to judge I think that's the most important thing that we're yeah. not here to judge yeah fantastic this brings me on to Katie's question which is on the topic of keeping quiet how do you get comfortable having uncomfortable conversations and how do you encourage others to address difficult and challenging topics when they may be less prepared to do so I mean, to be fair, in a lot of our <laughs> podcast episodes, I, I tend to just say, I mean, to the point where I probably look a bit silly in um, asking the question, but I think no question is a silly question. Um, other people might think I'm a bit silly for asking it, but at least I've got that knowledge at the end of, end of the day. How you encourage um, others, back to the same thing. Um, I think ta what Taj just said, no judgment. I think that is a really important um, point of view to come from. Um, the listening aspect is, is vital. Um, yeah that's it just listen I mean from my personal experience one thing um like me and my daughter we're going through our I'm going through perimenopause and she's going through starting her teenage years and uh, my husband's not very comfortable talking about women's issues but it's explaining to him why it's important for him to understand what we're going through he found finds it very uncomfortable which I respect but we're all in one household. He needs to understand why one of us gets upset or the other one's angry. So it's important that although it's an uncomfortable situation, we need to explain why these conversations need to be had. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to be cheeky now and ask a question of my own because... I'm obviously going to do that. Um, before you started changing suits, what were one of what were some of the most memorable experiences you had as an employee, positive or negative? Oh, so I'm, I'm going to be negative. I'm going to be negative. I was going to be negative. You take the positive. No, it's quite all right then. Um, for me, the negative um, experience of being an employee was when I th went through racism. And um, I went through it for a long time. And then when it was reported, the management didn't know how to handle it. And it's still it, the trauma is still with me today, because I remember when I went into new employment, as soon as there was any situation like that, I kind of seized up and it was anxiety for me. I think that's one of the worst experiences. And I still carry that trauma through with me and um, the positive experiences have been through employment is just making friendships and I've kept a lot of the friendships that I've made through my journey and I've made a real a lot of good friends I think that for my yeah I think for myself um I mean before we had changing suits I, I did have my own business prior to that I, I was employed in a, a, a multinational um corporation and it's really interesting to see the difference between small organisations and very large organisations and how personal you can get. I, I did find with small organisations, it, it does tend to get more personal. I'm still friends with many people in that smaller organisations, which didn't quite happen with the larger organisation. But I think there are turning points in your life. This isn't going to ask answer your question, Danielle, but I want to say it anyway. Um, <laughs> there are turning points in life. And 
my aunt passed away and I think that was a big turning point and it was a shock. Um, she had cancer and passed away within a very short period of time. And it did make me question, do I want to be employed, I suppose? And um, and what are my life choices? Um, because life just flies, right? Um, and that is when I decided to open my own business. Um, it was a franchise, to be fair. I didn't enjoy it, but the things I learned from it was great. It's all a learning experience. But this has been a different experience because we can shape the organisation how we like. Um, I'm working with my sister. Again, it's got po positives and negatives there. Um, so I can talk about a negative there, actually. <laughs> or you can listen to the <laughs> podcast episode. Um, but it's a case of, look, life is short. We've got to make the changes that we want to make. Um, whether you're employed, whether you're self-employed, whatever your situation is, are you happy in that situation? And if you're if you're not, then you're the only one that can change that. Essentially, no one else can do that for you. A negative working with um, your sister on that point is we don't talk about personal things as much and we do drive each other crazy sometimes. I think I answered <laughs> that question at the end. Daniel. <laughs> You made a question specifically to say that. I love it. It's all good. Um, <laughs> I was in politics. <laughs> <laughs> Sunil has actually shared with you a link to SouthAsianTherapist.org. Um, so before we pop off, you might want to copy paste that one or I can send it to you in an email later. Um, and Kathy has actually shared with you a charity uh, that may be useful for you called Staying Put, which is a charity in the West Yorkshire area to support with um, domestic abuse and violence or sexual abuse and violence. Okay. Um, that is all the questions from the chat, unless anybody wants to speed type one in. Thanks, Danielle. There are some lovely comments in the chat. When you get off this, you should just have a have a look at, at some of the posts because they're really, really lovely. Um, but thank you massively for taking some time out of your day today. That was really great and to everyone else I get to do this every month chatting to these two amazing women um, and you know they've brought a lot of of light to my life because I think they're doing something that is is really going to to change the world for the better and that you know they've got such an inspiring mission so massive thank you to you both and um, yeah we'll, we, we will see you soon. Can I just add, sorry, just before um, we do go off, I know we said thank you to Vicky, but as part of Emerald, I mean, you've got an absolutely fantastic leader and I take advantage because she's fantastic. So <laughs> thank you very much for having us on today um, and all the support, like I said, that we've had over the last year. Not at all. Thank you so much. And I will see you soon. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thank you. Bye.